God is not done yet. God is not done with you. God is not done with me. God is not done with this church. God is not done with this country. God is not done with his creation. God is not done yet. We continue our summer sermon series on the Apostles' Creed. This is the second to the last sermon in the series, and it, we focus on the second to the last line in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the resurrection of the body. When the Apostles' Creed affirms belief in the resurrection of the body, it is affirming this great truth that God's work is not complete, God's work is not finished, God's business is not done. And our scripture reading today from the book of the prophet Ezekiel is an example of this great truth. Ezekiel was a prophet during the time of the Jewish exile in Babylon. In 587 BC, the Babylonians came all the way over to Israel and Jerusalem, the Holy Land, conquered the Hebrew people, ransacked the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the Jewish temple, and deported most of the promising citizens back to Babylon to live as servants and provide cheap labor. In exile, the Hebrew people were not kept in prisons or camps. They were free to marry, build houses, plant crops, exchange goods. Some of them did well. They were also free to assemble, elect leaders, and to worship. But here was the thing. They found a hard time worshiping God in exile. They didn't really get over the destruction of the holy city Jerusalem and their temple. They were not where they wanted to be. They were not where they were supposed to be. In exile, they lived with a sadness that ran deep in their bones. As one of the Psalms says, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? All of us know a sadness that runs deep in our bones. We lose a job. We lose a spouse. We get a divorce. We lose a child, either to death or just emotionally. They're struggling, they're having problems, and the last thing they want is for us to tell them what to do. Or a close friend dies. All these are examples of a dream that fades. We had such hope, but the older we get, the more and more of our dreams just fade away. And they're replaced by a sadness. An existential sadness. A spiritual sadness. It's not the kind of sadness that makes us turn towards God. It's the kind of sadness that just makes us pay lunch less attention to God. Less and less. We find it difficult to connect, and we're in Babylon. We are not where we want to be. We are not where we're supposed to be. Over time, something happens. Over time, we attempt to numb that pain. We develop coping strategies to deal with things, to deal with our lives, to deal with diminished dreams, and we substitute other things. We work hard, or we pump a lot into something like our houses, or our gardens, or 
We collect things. We live quietly and we do the best we can, we're, but we're just making Babylon a nicer place to live. We can only numb the pain for so long, and then we realize that in numbing the pain, we are numbing that part of sel- ourselves that makes us feel alive. Without God, our lives become flat. I've noticed that when a spouse dies after a long and important marriage, the widow often finds it very difficult to come back to church. It takes time. It takes time because it's not the same. It's not the same to be in this place without that person. And it's, in fact, the world's a wholly, uh, whole different place without that person. And it's not that they've become less faithful not that they become less trusting. It's not that they still don't love the people. It's just harder because of the deep sadness. One day, the Spirit of the Lord grabs hold of the prophet Ezekiel and takes him to a valley of dry bones. And the Lord asks Ezekiel, mortal, can these bones live? Looking around at all the skeletons, Ezekiel thinks hard and says, well, Lord, only you know the answer to that. And that's one of the most smartest things anyone has ever said. Ezekiel recognizes what he knows, and he recognizes what God knows, and he knows there's a big difference between what he knows and what God knows, and oftentimes we don't quite recognize that difference. We tend to speak like we know it all. I remain a mystery unto myself, and yet I can act like I can size somebody else up in about 10 seconds. 10 seconds, and I can tell someone, well, what you need to do is this. And it sounds pretty good. But how does that strategy work for you? It doesn't work that well for me. I can't even tell the dog what to do. Every night, 10 o'clock, we go out. I don't need to go out. The dog needs to go out. Every night, 10 o'clock, I say, JC, let's go potty. You know what? Every night she resists. Every night she gives me a hard time. I have to, I, I have to be more than polite. And finally she gives in, and then we go out. The Lord tells Ezekiel, start preaching to the dry bones. And the Lord tells Ezekiel what to say. Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord your God to these dry bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live and know that I am the Lord. How foolish this must have seemed to Ezekiel. There he is, standing in the middle of a valley of dry bones, and he's supposed to tell them what to do. He's to give them hope. He's to tell them, you will come back alive again. Now, if I was Ezekiel, I would have gently suggested to the Lord that first he bring the dry bones back to life, and then I'll do the preaching, and then say, see what the Lord can do. But that's not the way it works. We are called to believe without seeing. We are called to believe before things happen. This is because it's the hope that makes it real. There's always that gap between the Word of God and the fulfillment, the promise and its coming true. 
in that space, there's room for hope. And it is the hope that makes us alive again. So I prophesied as I had had been commanded. Ezekiel tells us, and suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. Sinews came upon them. The Lord breathed life into the bones, and there is resurrection. The resurrection of bodies. The resurrection of dry bones. And this is a prelude to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Belief in Jesus' bodily resurrection is one of the controlling undercurrents of the New Testament. But the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, do not describe how Jesus' body was raised. The tomb is empty. When the women arrive, they are not expecting resurrection. They don't know what's going on with the empty tomb. Suddenly, Jesus appears in the flesh. What happened, we don't know. How did he get to that place? We don't know. This is why the women and those they tell are now faced with the decision whether to believe this or not. Is this real or is this not? To believe in the resurrection of the body is to believe that Jesus is raised in the real world. To believe that Jesus, to believe in the resurrection of the body is to believe that Jesus is not raised to an ethereal world or another dimension or this is not just spiritual, but that Jesus' body, his body, is raised in material, concrete reality. And what this means is that God is at work in our world, in real time, within physical reality, as we know it. The title of this sermon series is This I Believe, and I'm staking my claim right here. I believe in the resurrection of the body. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus' body. And I believe in the resurrection of our bodies because of his. This is supernaturalism. This is unexplicable. This is a great mystery. This is something that's only acceptable and only accessible to us through faith. Some of the women... And the disciples, they told, did believe in the resurrection of the body. They came to believe this. Some of them did come to believe that Jesus was dead and gone, but alive again in recognizable flesh. And because his body is raised, they had hope. They had hope that everything that he had said was true and everything that he promised would come true. They had hope that because he was raised, the grave could not contain him, and that death was defeated. They had hope that even though they were going to face difficult days ahead, including persecution, that they could endure. They had hope that because they had seen Jesus risen in his body, that they too would be raised in their bodies. They had hope because Jesus was raised, and that meant God was at work in their lives. I've had a little experience of something like this in my own life. When I graduated from college and went out to Princeton Seminary for the first semester, I had a terrible time. Existential sadness and angst. I didn't fit in. I didn't know what I was doing there. And I went and told the president, I'm dropping out. I'm, this is the wrong place for me. And he said a really smart thing. He said, okay, we'll miss you, but uh, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to personally save your spot. You know, you 
go do whatever you think you should do and you ever get some inkling that you should come back here, you call me. And so I went to Chicago. I'd never been in a big city. I'd never lived in a big city and moved in with a bunch of people and I can tell you our objective was not to study something and earn a degree. And I needed to support myself, and I had a painting business with another guy. We started it from nothing. We went to large apartment complexes, and we told them that we could paint those units cheaper than they could clean them when somebody moved out, and they believed us. And so we would buy five-gallon drums of white paint and put a grate in it and go into the apartments and have those long extension painting uh, things and we'd put it into the paint and we'd just slosh paint all over the place. This was painting, not decorating. And we had a flat fee for a three, two, one in studio apartments. And oh my gosh, we could paint two, three bedroom apartments in one day. The business boomed. I mean, it was totally by accident. And all of a sudden, we had not one complex, but we had five complexes. We were having to hire people, additional people. I'm 22 years old. I'm three months into a business that's, at that time, making close to $100,000. On Thursday, we did our thing. We got all our guys painting, and we painted painted two, three-bedroom apartments in a day, and the other guys were painting, and we had big boom boxes, and we'd pump in this rock and roll music so people would paint to the music and keep working, and we worked all day and went home. My buddy was killed that night in an accident. Just like that, he was gone. And I had to figure out what I'm going to do. And I saw the future. I could see that, wow, this could really go somewhere, you know? I can, don't need a partner. We're financially able to go forward, and we've got these 10 guys. Some of them can work, and uh, this, I could do it. And the prospect of painting apartments my entire life was right in front of me. And it was a deciding point. And the business closed that night. Paid everybody their, their payroll, paid all our debts, had a little bit of money left over. And I decided that I needed to kind of put things together. And what I did was I took all the money, I bought a plane ticket to Colorado, I got to Colorado and I bought backpacking equipment and stuff like that and I backpacked and climbed mountains for three months till the money ran out. I got to the last night, the end of the money. I was in Rocky Mountain National Park at the Y Camp. You know, there's a huge Y Camp right in Estes Park sitting by a stream, had no idea what was next. I'd already bombed out of Princeton Seminary. I'd already had this business that had come to an end. I, of course, had a, several girlfriends that said, <laughs> and my family is not understanding what I'm doing, because I didn't understand what I was doing. And I'm sitting on a rock, looking at the creek, and I heard a voice. Almost heard it, but it was so real. And the voice was saying, hey, I got something for you to do. And it's this. I was supposed to do this. 
called the president of Princeton Seminary and said, I'm ready to come back. He said, come on back, we got your spot. And had to jump through all the hoops, had to go through all the tests, do all the examination, have all the evaluations. But I was supposed to do this. And it's what I've been doing. But I didn't know until I was at the very end. I didn't know until I didn't have anything else left. I didn't know until the hope was really gone. I just didn't know. You know something about that, don't you? You've been there. You've been at the end. And you don't know what to do. And here you are. You were a valley of dry bones. And the breath was breathed into you. And you were raised to new life. The nation of Israel was the dry bones. They were not where they wanted to be. They were not where they were supposed to be. They were spiritually sad. It was deep into their bones. And the Lord breathed new life into them. and said, I'm going to take you back. You're going to go back there. You're going to go back to Jerusalem. You're going to go back to Israel. And that's what happened. They went back. But it turns out that their time in exile was the most creative time in their history. It turns out that their great literature comes out of that time. It turns out that the synagogue system, still in practice today, was developed while they were in exile. So instead of worshiping in a temple, they'd worship in smaller gatherings. Turns out that this is when they started to collect their scrolls and put them all in one place. First beginnings of the Bible in exile. Turns out they started to collect their songs and the stuff they sang in worship into one book. We call them the Psalms today. In exile, they developed new ways to practice their faith. And as they did, they grew in their understanding of who God was and how God works. And they did go back to Jerusalem, but it wasn't the same. It was different. It was different because they were different. Hope had changed them. And that's what hope does. Hope always does. Hope changes us. Hope makes room for us to trust that God is at work in this world. Hope makes room for us to trust that God is at work in our own lives. Hope makes room for us to believe that even though we're at the end, God is not at the end. Hope makes room for us to know that God is not done yet.